I hope uh, you had a very nice and intense uh, dinner last night, and I hope you survive it. Mm -hmm. um, so welcome to the last days of discussion. And uh, the first uh, discussion is going to be about uh, uh, the use of uh, quantum information in uh, quantum gravity. We have a fantastic lineup uh, of uh, igniters of discussion. And the first one is uh, Eugenio Bianchi from Penn State University. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I uh, really been enjoying the discussions of the past two days. I uh, loved it. And uh, I would like to contribute uh, with uh, this igniter talk uh, on uh, uh, how we can use quantum information in quantum gravity. And uh, I'm going to focus on one specific aspect, uh, uh, the aspect we have been working on uh, the Penn State node of KISS, that is the use of uh, the idea of uh, typical entanglement, in particular typical entanglement with constraints. That is something that has come up more than once in the past few days. And uh, I have two parts. The first part is really about quantum information, about the ideas behind this typical entanglement with constraints. And then it's used in quantum gravity, and I'm going to go through a number of steps in the example. So let me start with the quantum information part. And uh, um, this is something beautiful, and for the ones of you who are not already familiar with it, I would like to go through it slowly and then add uh, the technical part of the new recent developments. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me go back to this idea of 93 of Don Page, that is, uh, if you take uh, in your Hilbert space, and for concreteness here I'm considering a system of n qubits, if you take a random state in this Hilbert space, and you take a subsystem, for instance, uh, a subset of those qubits, and you compute the entanglement entropy, you look at it as a function of uh, the number of qubits in the subset, for each fraction you're going to find some value of the entropy. And you can ask the question, if I take this state at random, from my Hilbert space, what's the probability of finding some value of the entropy? Clearly, the entropy has to be below this theoretical maximum, but what's the probability of having some specific value? And uh, what Don Page answered in his classic paper on the average entropy of a subsystem is, uh, what is the average? And one can ask much more. One can ask, uh, what's the variance? Is that value of the entropy typical in the sense of uh, if I keep sampling, do I get always something close enough to the average? What is all the probability distribution in its momenta? Something we uh, studied together with Pietro Donà. Uh, but much more. Uh, there's something, there's probably a technicality that I've hidden that is, I've said, uh, take a random state in your Hilbert space. I have to give you the probability distribution. And there's a uniform probability distribution in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, but often what is relevant is not the probability distribution. There might be constraints, there might be ensembles that are different from the, re uh, from the uniform ensemble, from the hard ensemble, that are relevant, physically relevant. And uh, if you are interested in uh, classification and detailed study of this, uh, uh, this paper together with the condensed matter theories at Penn State and the uh, uh, mathematician colleagues at Melbourne, really introduces this in a pedagogical way in the format of a tutorial. Uh, so uh, to, uh, to illustrate this before starting with the technical part, so let me be concrete. Show again exactly what I said. Uh, take your n qubits, for instance, 10. Take a random state. Take three of the qubits. You do it once. You get some value of the entropy. You do it again and again. And you collect them into an histogram. And the average is this average was computed uh, long ago by Page. And it's close to the maximal entropy. And there's also a variance. And this variance is exponentially smaller. And that gives you this notion of typicality. And now you can also collect this as uh, subsystem sides. You take more and more uh, qubits in a subsystem. And you get this curve that is known as the Page curve with the line, the dashed line, being the average. And uh, you can zoom in and see the sample uh, that I was describing before. OK, so this is the standard setting. Now the problem. And yet, yeah, the problem that is relevant for us in quantum gravity. The problem is that all that assumes an Hilbert space that is, first of all, finite dimensional. 
so that you have a notion of uniform probability distribution. If already it's harmonic oscillators, it's infinite dimensional, and you cannot do it anymore. And second, it assumes that there's a tensor product structure. Sometimes you have, but often you just don't have for free. Uh, in particular, this, uh, you don't have a finite dimension in Hilbert space in quantum field theory or in quantum gravity, and you don't have a natural notion of tensor product in quantum field theory or in quantum gravity. So how do you address that? And uh, so the next two slides are technical, but they are related to something we discussed uh, this week. I'm going to go through that for, for the many experts in the room. I'm going to give two perspectives. The first is operational. When you look at a subsystem, you can characterize the subsystem in an operational way by saying, what measurements do you make? You define the subsystem by the set of measurements that you're making, the subalgebra of the observables of the system. And when you do that, you will notice that if you define the subsystem in terms of a subalgebra, then the rest of the system is everything that commutes with that subalgebra. And in general, uh, there's an intersection between these two. There's a center. And when that happens, you have a decomposition. It is not a tensor product, but it's still a structure that's quite simple. It's a direct sum of tensor products. OK, I'm going to describe again this thing in a different language, in a language that is close to the one that uh, we use in quantum gravity, in quantum gravity, for instance, where we have a kinematical Hilbert space and then constraints that give us physical space. Let me consider first a factorized Hilbert space, one that already comes with this notion of tensor product. And then uh, there's a constraint that here I'm going to assume to be addictive. And uh, my physical Hilbert space is a subset, and I can decompose it by diagonalizing first one portion of the constraint, and I get back this structure. So why this is helpful? Now I can ask again the question of entanglement entropy in a subsystem, and typical entanglement entropy. And now the projection of the constraint gives me first a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and second, a structure is not a tensor product structure, but you can still look at quantities like the average entanglement entropy and the probability distribution. And here I'm showing this formula that we obtained with Pietro Donat, that is a formula, the average entanglement entropy of a typical state, just in terms of dimensions of this sector. OK, so this is the technical result. And the rest of the presentation is an illustration of a, a number of ways in which we can use this quantum information tool in quantum gravity. OK? So let me go to the second part. And in the second part, I'm going to discuss four physical systems where uh, this notion, this technical notion that I introduced, is going to be relevant. The first is a condensed matter system. I'm going to discuss how thermality arises from entanglement. And then uh, a few others that you can read here. So I want to be concrete, not the most general case. Let me consider a version of the SYK model. We have a system of n fermions with an Hamiltonian that is a sum of n body interactions, maybe number conserving with uh, the coupling constants such that you can think of it as uh, some uh, as a random matrix extracted from a specific ensemble. And uh, you can look at energy against states with fixed particle number, and you can think of them as, uh, uh, as a constraint. My constraint Hilbert space is not the full Hilbert space of the system, but the sector at fixed energy and fixed particle number. OK? So as a condensed matter theorist, you would just say these are quantities that are fixed in the experiment. But as a quantum gravity theorist, you can really think of it as this is my full Hilbert space, physical one. And you can look at the page curve again. You see it plotted here uh, at different uh, 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 filling fractions, so number of excitations. And the thing that I want to highlight is that there are new phenomena that arise. The first is that uh, you get a volume low with a slope that depends on this field fraction. And this one has a thermodynamic interpretation. If you think of it as a paramagnet, this is telling you that the entropy depends on the volume with a coefficient that depends on the average energy or on the temperature. And so you're really deriving thermodynamics from entanglement. The second remark is that there are corrections. And these are entanglement corrections. These are sub-extensive illustrated here, square root of volume. These were first observed numerically uh, by uh, uh, Marcus Rigol and Leth Wiedmer, and uh, bringing some tools that we have developed for quantum gravity, we see how uh, yeah, one can derive 
these corrections, these non-expensive corrections uh, uh, in this system. Okay, so this was the first example, thermality from entanglement. Second example, quantum field theory. So now I'm gonna do something different, but I think important. Before I was slicing my subsystem in geometric regions, I had my many body system, I look at the region, I compute the entanglement of a region, I have a notion of volume. You can do also that in quantum field theory. It's gonna give you divergences, area of divergence. I'm gonna consider a different subsystem. The subsystem is defined operationally as, uh, you have an antenna coupled to your electromagnetic field in the box, and you ask, what does the antenna pick? That's my subsystem. That's a subalgebra of observables. That's a subalgebra of observables that, uh, that captures only modes that resonate with the antenna. Defines a structure that is not a tensor product, it's a direct sum of tensor product, and here you get the physical interpretation immediately. The total energy, I fix it, I say it's pure state in the box, a fixed energy. Some of the energy is fixed, the rest is not. Direct sum of the energy. So that's the center of my subalgebra. And now you can compute the typical entanglement entropy for the modes captured by the antenna in a typical energy against state. And what do you find? You find again a thermal entropy. Thermal entropy and uh, as a function of the energy. So you can also define a temperature out of entanglement and a heat capacity out of entanglement and quantum corrections due to entanglement. This was example two. We go to example three, quantum gravity. I'm gonna do this for black holes. Again, for black holes, one could consider a geometric entanglement entropy. For instance, modes inside the horizon and outside the horizon. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna take seriously this logic of a subalgebra of observables and look at the subalgebra that is at infinity, it's an asymptotically flat boundary condition. We measure the mass sectors at fixed mass and we measure only uh, uh, monopole fluctuations. Forget all the multiple uh, fluctuations. And uh, you take one energy against state, typically in Dilbert space, trace over everything else, and you look at the entanglement entropy of this subalgebra, and uh, you do the calculation, and you get the Beckett spin hawking formula. You can do it also with fixed mass and spin, you're gonna get again the area. So you get the area microcanonically. Okay, next point. So this one is uh, really about quantum information structure of space time. And uh, it's a difficulty that in quantum gravity we have to address, and in particular in loop quantum gravity we have to address directly. That is uh, um, the feature of quantum gravity. In a condensed matter system, and even in a quantum field theory, you can use energy to organize your state. You have your big Hilbert space, and then you can look at the corner of low energy state, finite energy state. And you observe that uh, at low energy, as you lower the energy, you transition from a volume low thermal against state thermalization down to an area low for the vacuum. And in quantum gravity, we have a synthetically flat boundary condition. So you could do the same. You could fix the ADM energy infinity and lower that. And if you had a full theory of quantum gravity, in principle, you could ask similar questions. Now, that is difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, there is something else that in the community of quantum gravity, people have been focusing on, that is considering finite regions, general boundaries as in Halagar's uh, lecture. And uh, when you consider finite regions, you don't have an immediate notion of energy. Lorraine is gonna tell us more about notions that arise for these finite regions. But you cannot immediately generalize and use this notion of use the energy as the way of slicing your Hilbert space. So there's a question, can we reverse the perspective and use entanglement itself as a probe uh, and uh, I'm uh, putting here this conjecture that we uh, uh, introduced together with Rob Myers, that is, you can use entanglement uh, as a probe in the sense of uh, uh, the conjecture that semi-classical states in your full physical Hilbert space uh, belong to a sector or to a corner of the Hilbert space, the corner where for a region, for a, a causal region, the entropy goes as the area of the corner of the region. 
Now, this is a statement about semi-classical states in the physical liberty case. It's not about all of quantum gravity. It's only the sector where you have a classical geometry with more quantum fluctuation. And the question is, uh, are there other states that are away from this? And clearly, the early universe, we don't expect it to be about the semi-classical gravity. And there is a perspective of how entanglement arises or is produced in the primordial universe. Uh, something we have explored, uh, something that a group of Francesca Vidotto has been exploring in detail in spin form, of how starting from uh, a state that is quantum gravity state, maybe with no entanglement, or maybe with uh, typical entanglement, the quantum quench goes through a production of sufficient entanglement to explain the correlation in the CMB. And I'll conclude here. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, Eugenio. Um, next speaker is uh, Rob Meyer. I take the opportunity to remind you that uh, we don't have questions now, this you know, but uh, if you have a question, you can also put it on the post-its uh, and bring the post-its here during the coffee break. Okay, well, I'll start by uh, thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to this very interesting meeting. I apologize that I haven't been able to spend any time here except this morning. Uh, but what I've seen on the live stream, it's been a very productive, very exciting uh, get together. Uh, so I'm glad to be here today. Um, I was told uh, in an email that I'm giving a the string theory perspective here. Um, and so I, I wanted to start with a caveat, which is that I will give you a perspective of one string theorist, and I'm only going to give you a small sliver of lots of different kinds of activity that have been going on. Um, in particular, uh, in recent years, there's been this idea of it from qubit, um, which has really come to be known as an umbrella or, or a moniker to describe the idea that in string theorists uh, or in the string theory community, it's been realized that uh, quantum information provides us with a very interesting perspective, techniques, tools, in which to understand questions about quantum gravity. And perhaps that's very natural. I mean, what are we, with hindsight, what are these folks over here doing? They're trying to understand systems with entanglement and quantum features and many degrees of freedom. But what do I have over here? Well, I have a system with many degrees of freedom. And as, we'll, well, as I'll, I'll discuss, what you realize is that those quantum features, the entanglement, perhaps ideas like complexity, are playing a role in characterizing, uh, well, as Bia uh, Eugenio was saying, the entanglement is, is perhaps an interesting probe of states over here. Um, in today's talk, as I'll show you, though, what's really been driving this discussion in uh, the community where I uh, work is holography. And so I should start with an introduction there. What I really mean is the ADS-CFT uh, correspondence. What is that? Well, it's really just a dictionary. I've got one set of physical phenomena, and I've got two different languages which are describing that same set of phenomena. So what are those languages? Well, on one side I have anti de Sitter space, but what the language really is, is it's a discussion, it's a, that's where the gravity lives. Um, but it's gravity with a negative cosmological constant, and I'm going to specify the space-time dimension. And so here in my cartoon, this is a picture or a cartoon of anti de Sitter space, the simplest solution of Einstein's equations with a negative cosmological constant. On the other side, the language is the language of quantum field theory. But in this particular case, it's a very special set of quantum field theories. In particular, there are no scales, even at the quantum level, and that's why they're called conformal field theories. The dimension of the space-time is different, and it really is just quantum field theory, regular quantum field theory. There is no gravity. And there's a sense in which this theory lives on the boundary of this bulk space-time. The difference in dimension, of course, is why we use the language or use the word holography. And there are many bells and whistles that I'm not telling you about, 
But for the most part today, you should think that I've pushed the theory into a corner where on this side, I'm not really looking at full quantum gravity, I'm just looking at semi-classical gravity. And what that means on the other side of the dictionary is that my field theory is at strong coupling and there are a large number of degrees of freedom. So I said it was a dictionary, and so that gives us, uh, or allows us to translate between these two settings, or these two languages. In the language of the quantum field theory, I might think about this problem here, which Eugenio uh, was talking about. This is a time slice, say, in my conformal field theory. And what I've done is I've partitioned that time slice into two regions, and I'm going to ask, what is the entanglement entropy between the interior degrees of freedom and the exterior degrees of freedom? And what our friends up in the top here, Sensei Ru and Tadashi Takinagi, showed us is we can translate that into a geometric problem. On the, in the gravity language, what I think about are surfaces that are stretching down from the boundary into the bulk space-time, they're anchored on the same surface here, this, which partitions my time slice. And what I'm instructed to do here is apply this formula. Part of the formula is very familiar. It's just the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for black hole entropy. But we're really applying it in an unusual setting or a different setting. These are, I'm not talking about black holes or horizons. These are extremal surfaces. What I'm doing, is, or what I'm really looking for, is the minimal uh, area surface that satisfies these boundary conditions. So you can think of this as a soap bubble, and what it is is the geometry of the space-time or the gravity is weighing heavily on the soap bubble or, and it, or the soap film, and it's pulling it down into the bulk geometry. But I, at the end of the day, I find that extremal surface, I evaluate the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, and it turns out that gives me the entanglement entropy that I was looking for in the boundary field theory. As I said there, this really geometrizes the entanglement structure. And so I really wanted to, or I wanted to illustrate that with a nice example or, or to really show how that comes out. This is an inequality called strong subadditivity. When I have two overlapping regions in that picture. And what I want to show you is that it really, uh, that was too fast, it really amounts to a very simple proof for these holographic systems. So on one side, I've got, uh, I've got these two regions in the boundary theory, there's an overlap here. On that side, I'm considering the entropy associated with both of those regions, and so there are these two extremal surfaces. But note, because of that overlap, they're going to intersect here. On the other hand, on the other side of the inequality, I've got the intersection and the union, and so I'll end up looking at surfaces like this. Now, why is that inequality satisfied? Well, I'm just going to take these two surfaces and reorganize the areas into the red region and the yellow region. If I look at the red region, it's actually in the class of surfaces that I extremized over for this I union, I, I1, I2. But this is the extremal surface. This is the minimal area surface. And so I know that this area is larger than that one. Similarly, I can look at the yellow region. It lives in the class that uh, was relevant for the intersection. Again, it's not the extremal surface, so it has a larger area. And hence, this inequality is satisfied by a simple proof by pictures. That's the kind of uh, simplicity that, that arises from this uh, Ru Takinagi prescription. Of course, I'm not proving this inequality in general. I'm proving it for these holographic theories where the Ru Takinagi prescription applies. Quite generally, then, this has been around now for over 15 years, and it led to a fruitful dialogue where we learn new things about quantum field theories, but we also learn some lessons for quantum gravity. One of the most recent things, well, this is a, actually a relatively perhaps five years old, is the idea that we might want to think about quantum corrections in the bulk. Those are uh, corrections in the boundary theory that are inverse powers of the number of degrees of freedom. 
And so in that case, what we think about is, again, a very similar formula, but what I'm looking at here is what I'll call the generalized gravitational entropy. This, again, I'm borrowing a formula that's familiar. This is something that um, actually uh, Jacob Bekenstein would have introduced in discussing uh, the generalized uh, second law of black holes. So again, we're taking a well-known formula and we're applying it perhaps in an unusual setting. But the key uh, of my, or the key reason for introducing this idea is that while it was really seen originally as producing small corrections to uh, various results that we might have achieved up here, it's really been a key tool in some recent computations of the page curve for black holes and black hole evaporation. And so very briefly then, what happens is, or well, those results, those computations can be formulated uh, with this so-called island rule. And the idea is that what I'm doing is I'm imagining that I have a black hole in my gravitating region, and I'm coupling it to a reservoir at infinity, and I'm going to collect all of the Hawking radiation in that reservoir. That's going to be a non-gravitational or a non-gravitating system, and I can manipulate the, the Hawking radiation as I usually do in quantum field theory, and I can ask how much entropy is there in that radiation. And the island rule says that I apply this formula. Again, it looks very much like uh, the formula that I had before, and it's, it's a, a descendant, or it evolved from the uh, entanglement entropy formula that I showed you on the previous transparency. You've got, again, a quantum field theory contribution, and you've got a gravitational or a Bekenstein-Hawking uh, contribution. What am I calculating entropy of? Well, this is the radiation in the box or in the reservoir at infinity, but I'm also allowing for the inclusion of so-called islands or regions of the space-time in the black hole uh, or in the gravitational system. And if I apply this formula uh, at early stages, what I find is, well, there, there are no islands when I try and extremize or minimize here. Um, and if you like, the island is just the empty set, and all I'm doing is I'm calculating the usual entanglement entropy of the radiation. This is what Hawking did, and so what I see is that the entropy starts down here at zero when the black hole is formed, and then it increases and grows and grows until the black hole is completely evaporated, and then it saturates. On the other hand, in this formula, there, uh, where I'm allowing for this new possibility of including these geometric regions near the black hole, after a long time, or uh, a roughly half the evaporation time, a large amount of entanglement grows between the reservoir and the interior of the black hole. And so what I find is that there's a new saddle in this calculation, a saddle which includes a non-trivial island or a region near the black hole, and as a result, that um, lowers the answer that I'm getting here. And in fact, what you do is you recover a curve very much like this, as Page suggested we should find uh, many, so many years ago. A simple, for me, a relatively simple example where we can apply that formula is one where I extend the usual holographic models that I talked about. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to embellish the model by not just having anti de Sitter space, but I'm going to stick a brain into the geometry. That brain is allowed to back react and, and produce a more interesting geometry in here. But essentially, holography, as I described it, describes two different systems. One is this gravitational system with the brain, the other is the boundary theory, where I have my CFT, the brain extends to infinity, and so there I find that there's a defect, or there's an extra uh, subsystem that I've introduced into my theory. Now, on the gravitational side, there's something interesting that happens that Randall and Sundrum taught us over 20 years ago, which is that with this back reaction, you actually find that there are new gravitational modes, in particular 
there is a light graviton that basically lives on that brain. And so there's actually a third description of the system that acts at least as an effective field theory or an effective description of the system. And so I can actually describe this as the boundary conformal field theory, but rather than being connected to this defect, it's connected to a gravitational region um, that also supports a copy of the quantum field theory. And that's a place where I can apply this island formula. There's a lot of ca calculations one goes through, but it just reduces to a competition, again, between different saddles or different Ru Takianagi surfaces. But it illustrates this result here, and what one finds is the expected page curve uh, in, in this description here. So I'm running out of time, and all I'll say is, you know, I've, I've only given you uh, a glimpse into the kind of uh, work that my colleagues and I are, or the questions that we're asking. Um, and there's, you know, as many unanswered questions as there are answered questions. And so there's still lots to explore. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rob. And uh, let me use this opportunity as Rob, is also, uh, Rob Myers is also the director of uh, the Perimeter Institute uh, to thank the Perimeter Institute for supporting this conference. And Yes. <laughs> and now we go to the Paris uh, uh, node of Keys uh, with Pablo Arrighi. Hello. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Pablo Arrighi. I'm a professor at University Paris-Saclay in the informatics department. Our group is called QUAC, Quantum Computation Structure. Uh, I'll be giving a quantum information perspective on what I would call the problem of quantum gravity, and let me uh, say what I mean by that. So we have two uh, beautiful theories with salient features. The quantum theory could be seen like uh, a car. It's got fundamental elements to it, like norm one superposition. That could be the wheels. We've got general relativity. That could be a plane. It's got salient features like dynamical geometry. And some of features are common, like those two vehicles, they don't go beyond a certain uh, uh, speed. Uh, there is a bounded speed of information in both theories. And so what you would expect from trying to reconcile these things into a common mathematical setting is, of course, a flying car with uh, wings and wheels and a bounded speed of information. Now, currently, as far as I see, the approaches rely on prescribing the dynamics through a Feynman path integral method. But as you do that, you're really not sure whether you are preserving the norm. And so if you're not sure whether you are preserving the norm, then you may run into signaling problem. And this is something that is well known uh, in quantum information theory. When you try to say that a local operation doesn't signal, you need to say that this local operation is trace preserving. This has been put also uh, beautifully in, in, a, in a paper by Bob. Okay, another issue is that, well, uh, here I'm you know, referring to the boundary formalism, but I could view this initial geometry, this graph, as evolving in time into this output graph. But throughout the evolution, some nodes may merge, for instance, destroying some carriers of information. Is that compatible at all with uh, unitarity, say? Or worse, uh, we could be saying, well, there is a dynamical geometry here in the bulk of uh, this uh, boundary that sort of a non-controlled quantum soup, and maybe that signals as well. So here is the sort of state we're at. It doesn't look anymore like a flying car. And so I would like to see whether a quantum information perspective can fix some of these problems. By the way, uh, we often hear that 
uh, the problem is with, with quantum gravity is that we don't have enough experimental data to uh, sort of fine tune the details, but these problems, you see, they don't have anything to do with experimental data. I would say that we do have experimental data and that we know that we want to uh, have a car and a plane merged into a flying car. All right, so um, the first issue I was pointing was that uh, in order to have causality, in order to not to have signaling, a precondition for that is to have unitarity. So we just have to make sure that our evolution is unitary. You can then define a Feynman path integral after that, if you like. Okay, on to the second issue. So we are, we are saying, look, there are two nodes here, they merge. What happens to the information? Is it destroyed? Another way to put it is, let's say that I have a node that splits U. How am I going to call the, the new node? V or W? And if I go back in time with U dagger, then this choice is going to lead to something non-unitary. Now, those things, they can be fixed. If you just look at the math, you end up saying, well, u is going to split into maybe u dot l and u dot r. u dagger is going to merge two nodes. Well, let me just call them without generality. The merger, I'm going to call it v merge w. Okay? And then you start deriving non-trivial things from that because you realize that if you apply u dagger to the splitting of this node, you get u dot l merged with u dot r, but this should be the same as u. So you end up having this equality upon the names of your node. So some non-trivial name algebra for your, for your node comes out just out of the sheer necessity of preserving norms and having a dynamical geometry. I'm saying you can let the math speak for itself and it will tell you things. The third problem is way uh, more involved, and it's this question of uh, making sure that even uh, in the bulk of a uh, boundary, information doesn't go too fast to respect a certain light cone there. But if you want to formalize that, you need to be able to speak about this piece of graph within the larger input graph, and this piece of graph and say, ah, information uh, is limited to going from there to there. And so you need a, a more robust notion than the usual notion of tensor product. This is an issue that was also mentioned uh, by Eugenio. And here we have a concrete proposal. This is a tensor product that takes in two graphs and it tries to fit them together. If the left piece is indeed for instance, a disk around the node of some graph G and, and the right piece is indeed the complement of the graph, then you give back the graph, otherwise you give back the null vector. And it's kind of surprising to give back the null vector, but it works very well mathematically. This is joint work with Amelia Durbeck, Matt Wilson. So, but as you try and define a tensor product over graph, you will run into mathematical difficulties, like if in your Hilbert space there are disconnected graphs and connected graphs, and you do the tensor product of two nodes, then what do you mean as a graph? Is this the disconnected one or the connected one? So you need to fix these things if you want to start doing these things uh, seriously. And, uh, one possibility for fixing it, it's, a, it's one possible solution, is to encode the geometry again in those names. So here I'm saying Y and Z have nothing in common, it's disconnected. Here uh, there is a minus Z in common in the, in the name of this node and, uh, uh, and the Z here. And so that codes for an edge. If you adapt, if you, if you use this naming convention to describe the connectivity, then you resolve this ambiguity, Y and Z put together are disconnected, whereas these guys, uh, they are connected. Okay. And so, 
adopting these conventions and this, uh, this generalized tensor product, you can uh, have, for instance, the disk of radius one around this node glued with the complements, and that gives you back this graph. And this is not a correct gluing because this is not like a radius one, and so this goes to zero. And not only do you have a good notion of a tensor product, but you can actually derive a notion of a partial trace that corresponds to that. That is, you have a superposition of graphs, you have a node, and you want to take a disk around the node, you want a partial trace around the disk, around the disk and, uh, and uh, this is the formula that will work it out for you. And by the way, it's not that crazy, this is a trace-preserving, completely positive operation on the Hilbert space. Once you have got this set of tools, you can really speak about what it means to be a local operation. A local operation is something that modifies just a, a, a little region around the vertex and produces maybe some superposition of disk there. And uh, you can formalize this in, in, in various ways. This is very familiar. This is familiar to the uh, observable uh, approach. And so you can actually define a local operator that's going to maybe split or merge nodes maybe in a, in a superposition that meets these, um, these, uh, these masks. These, uh, yeah. And you become also able to formalize properly what it means to be, uh, to be, for information not to go too fast, even when you are inside this, um, this boundary, and so you are in this quantum soup of geometry. And, uh, and again, you will find that the formulas, they are very familiar uh, concepts. This is the algebraic approach. And so you will get a flying car. You will get a flying car with some moving particles on a lattice, but when they move, that triggers merger or, uh, or splitting, and you'll get a little toyish example of something that meets uh, all, the, all the criteria uh, that uh, I was mentioning earlier on like norm preservation, bounded speed, dynamical geometry. So the, the point I wanted to make here is that if you come from this quantum information perspective, you, you, yeah, you believe in uh, quantum superpositions, you, you try and do the job of reconciling norm preservation, bounded speed, dynamical geometry into a consistent mathematically uh, consistent, uh, sorry, sorry, in a mathematically consistent setting, well, turns out you run into tons of difficulties, but so be it. And uh, this will be a forum for mathematics to tell you uh, what this flying car should look like. Uh, here, in particular, we reached some non-trivial conclusions, like this kind of name algebra for naming nodes, uh, the fact that you need a robust notion of tensors and traces, uh, and the fact that the bounded speed of information propagation can be formalized even in the, this bulk of quantum soup. And the last uh, igniter of discussion of this session is uh, Akin Ken from Waterloo University. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so the, quest, the question heading this session is, how can we use information in quantum gravity? And I think there are basically two attitudes uh, towards that question. Uh, the one attitude is, um, fairly practical. We can say with confidence that information theory is naturally very versatile. Uh, and that's because information theory doesn't care about what it describes. So therefore, it's quite natural that information theory, information theory tools find applications all over science. And therefore, of course, also in quantum gravity, and we've, of course, seen plenty of examples for that. In this case, the attitude is Quantum information theory, or information theory in general, may provide tools for quantum gravity. Not more, not less. 
The second attitude that one may take is this. We could speculate that information theory is not only versatile, because it doesn't care what it describes, maybe it is actually universal. Maybe information theory, because of that property of not caring what it describes, is universal in the, in the sense that it can describe literally everything, and that therefore there might be a fundamental information theory of which then quantum gravity emerges. That would be a very different status of uh, information theory. So is information theory just versatile, or is it even universal? I will give an example of both. A simple example for the first case where information theory is just a tool. An example that maybe is not as much known as other examples. And I will hazard a guess as to how it might look if we uh, follow the second attitude here. So I start with the first attitude, information theory providing tools. Here's a tool that it can provide. And that tool is called Shannon Sampling Theory. Shannon Sampling Theory is an integral part of information theory. It's actually at the heart of it. It's at the very center of it. Shannon Sampling Theory establishes the equivalence of discrete and continuous representations of information. Now, how could this be a new tool in physics? Well, it has been generalized to curved spaces and curved space time. And as a consequence, it provides tools to describe space-time simultaneously as continuous and discrete in mathematically exactly the same way that communication engineers have been describing information as being simultaneously continuous and discrete for half a century. See, for example, when you record music, you have a file on your computer, that's all discrete. And yet, as I will show in the next slide, it can be entirely equivalent to the continuous signal that you hear as music. There's no error in between. This is not an approximation. So how does this work? Here's the basic Shannon sampling theorem. It says that if you consider a function that is band limited, in physics this would be having an ultraviolet cutoff. Um, if you consider a function that's band limited, by definition this means that this function is the Fourier transform of some other function, f tilde, but the Fourier transform limited to a finite frequency range. Now, Shannon sampling theorem says that for band limited function, the following is true. If you know its samples, its values at a discrete set of points, then if these points are spaced no further apart than pi over the band limit, then you can reconstruct what the function's values are everywhere, even between those sample points. And notice that this is an equality sign. There's no approximation here. This is exact. And also, it doesn't matter where you take your samples, any lattice is good enough, as long as its spacing meets that criterion that the spacing is not wider than pi over b. Which is to say, we're able to use this to describe um, physics in a way that it is not on a lattice, it is not just continuous, it's both. You can write it down on any lattice you want that has the required spacing, or you can write it as a continuum theory. Differential equations are equivalent to finite difference equations, and so on. Integrations are equivalent uh, to summations, and there's no approximation. It's all exact, and it doesn't break translation invariance. You see, the music that you pull from a file doesn't remember on which the grid it was discretized. And uh, this can be applied and has been applied to physics, for example, to inflationary cosmology where you can then use this um, to calculate under the assumption that there's a covariant Planck scale cutoff, what the impact would be for the CMB fluctuations. And what you find is that there is some impact of the order of 10 to the minus five. Very hard to measure, but maybe not impossible. All right, but this was just an example of using the first attitude, using information theory as a provider of tools for quantum gravity. What if we go all the way and just for the heck of it think, well, maybe information theory could be universal and describe everything and maybe quantum gravity would emerge from it or the standard model and gravity and all of that might emerge from a purely information theory, a pure information theory. 
Now, why would we expect such a thing to be possible? Why could information play such an important role? Well, as I said at the beginning, information theory doesn't care about what it describes. So maybe it can simply describe everything. So maybe information is sort of the basic currency of all physical degrees of freedom. How could that look? How could quantum gravity be emergent from information theory? And what are the building blocks of information theory? It could be argued that the building blocks of information theory are endpoint correlators. No, if n equal to 1, then we just have probability distribution. And there we get into entropies, Renyu entropies, Shannon entropies, Fermat entropies. n equal to, that gives us mutual information, that gives us coherent information. And from those, we can then define classical and quantum channel capacities. n equals 3 and 4, well, that gets much harder already. Um, it gives us a web of informational relationships. And of course, there's a lot of work on that already uh, going on, both classical and quantum. And so now, let's try to go all the way and imagine the possibility that maybe fundamentally nature is describable by a collection of fundamental abstract endpoint correlators. Just correlators. Initially, not referring to any space-time or any matter at all. Just correlators of, well, whatever, just correlators. You know, n equal 1 to whatever high. Then, could it be that in some low energy regime, I mean, we haven't defined what energy is, let's just say, in some regime, these correlators here that are initially abstract and don't refer to space-time, don't refer to matter in any way, could it be that, in, that there might be some regime in which these abstract correlators then have a mathematical representation, at least in an approximate way, as quantum field theoretical correlators on a curved space-time. You see, if so, then in that sense, we could say that quantum field theory on space-time, on curved space-time as we know it, would be emergent from such a web of informational structure there. Now, is there any chance that such a thing could work? Well, let's start with matter and then consider space-time. Well, is matter describable through correlators? Well, uh, that's easy, right? <laughs> of course it is. Quantum field theory is made out of endpoint functions, endpoint correlators. So that's nothing new. Um, but what we can add using information theory is an information theoretic view of this, that quantum field theoretical interactions constitute quantum channels. You see, whenever you have an interaction, information can be exchanged. Any interaction, um, let's say two particles uh, scatter off each other, each particle learns some classical information about the other, but also each particle learns some quantum information about the other in the sense that they hand over entanglement to each other. You see, if two particles are interacting with each other, let's, let's say particle A and B, A might have previously been entangled with a particle A tilde, B might have previously been entangled with a particle B tilde, a and B scatter, and afterwards, you know, they might even be now entangled with what the other one was entangled with before. And that's what quantum channel capacity studies. And it is possible to study all interactions in terms of their classical and quantum channel capacities. What I'm conjecturing here, this is just a remark, not really central to my argument here, is that the Feynman rules which describe interactions, that is to say the interaction Hamiltonians, might be entirely describable in terms of, a, of their classical and quantum channel capacity properties. Which might be interesting, right? Because we think usually of interactions as momenta scattering and quantum numbers being exchanged, but maybe the whole thing can be just reformulated in terms of classical and quantum channel capacities. And then we would have an information theoretic picture of a standard model, for example. If you're interested in that with some collaborators and students, I recently um, wrote two papers on that. I mean, towards this. I didn't really <laughs> finish this program at all. OK, so matter clearly is describable through correlators. How about space-time? Is space-time describable through correlators? Well, it turns out, yes. Um, with two students in a grad course that I taught, 
um, who came after me, uh, who came after class to me and said, well, maybe we can work this thing out that I suggested in class, we found the following is possible. The metric tensor can be expressed through the propagator. So if you take, for example, the scalar product, the propagator of a klein gordon field, let's call it D2, two-point correlator, D is the space-time dimension, then you can calculate the metric from the two-point correlator. On one hand, it's clear that the metric, that curved space-time, affects the propagator. In fact, it affects the propagator so much that the propagator knows everything about the space-time. You can calculate from the propagator what the space-time is. So what that means is that you can describe a space-time as a differentiable manifold with a metric or a differentiable manifold with an affine connection and so on, but you can also describe it as a manifold with a two-point propagator on it. This is how you can get the metric back. Shouldn't be surprising that it's something like that should be possible because uh, the propagator uh, is a function of the space-time distance, right? It, the propagator tells you the correlation between the quantum fluctuations here and there, and the larger the space-time distance, the less is the correlation, and so the correlation strength is a proxy for distance. Anyway, so what that means is that the two-point correlator as a space-time function is equivalent to knowing the metric. Knowing this, we can calculate that. So let's keep that in mind because we need it in a minute again. So the summary so far is that both matter and space-time are expressible through quantum field theoretical endpoint functions. And um, as correlators, they can definitely be described information theoretically. We can dig into this and calculate classical and quantum channel capacities, uh, mutual information, coherent information, optimizing over that, and so on. But then you might say, well, okay, but it's just a reformulation so far, right? We're just describing what we knew before with information theoretic language and tools. And after all, the endpoint functions, um, no, the two-point, three-point, et cetera, point functions are space-time correlators. Right? So, aren't we still assuming that there is a space-time to start with when we write things in this way? And sure we are. Right? We're assuming that this lives on some manifold. And then using a two-point function, for example, we can calculate what the metric is and so on. But we're still assuming that there's a space-time manifold to start with. Do we have to? Remember, the idea here is to try to go all the way and say maybe an information theory is at the very heart of it. And quantum gravity, and by that I mean space-time, curved space-time, and quantum fields living on it, should emerge from that. So we can't plug a manifold in there if we want to get it out. Now, let's try. So let's consider our endpoint correlators now, no longer as functions on a manifold, but instead as operators on a Hilbert space. Consider, for example, the, the Feynman propagator. You can view it as a Green's function, as a function of two variables. But really, fundamentally, it's an operator of a Hilbert space on a Hilbert space of fields. It takes a field and maps it into another field through an integral kernel. It's an operator. And the same is true for all endpoint functions. They might take multiple fields and map them into a field. But they're always operators in the sense that they map uh, elements of a Hilbert space into the Hilbert space. They are operators, but not just of the usual kind, right? Usual operators take one vector, map it into one vector. Endpoint functions, no. They take multiple vectors and map them into one vector. Still, you can consider concepts such as diagonalization. All right, so let's consider these endpoint correlators as abstract operators not given necessarily in any representation, not necessarily as integral kernels, but just as operators. You have an abstract Hilbert space and you move one or several vectors into a vector. Let's assume that that's what we have. Endpoint correlators that are abstract operators on some Hilbert space, not assuming any manifold structure, space-time, or, or matter fields, or any of that. So given that we assume that they are given basis independently, well then, as correlators, we can always interpret them as some sort of web of informational structure, you know, with um, um, uh, mutual information and coherent information and capacities. But 
can they always be represented as endpoint correlators of a local quantum field theory on a curved space time? No, of course not. In general, if we just write down some operators there that map copies of the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space, there's no reason that these abstract correlators can be represented as quantum field, theory, quantum field theoretical uh, correlators on a curved space time. In general, they cannot. So when can they be represented as field correlators on a space-time? You see, a, a one point I want to make here is that this means it's a much more general structure than propagators on a quantum field theory, right? Uh, on on a, a propagators of a quantum field theory on a curved space-time. It's much more general. Some of these will be representable like that, but a general, generally not. <coughs> right. uh, Okay, so how, how can it work? How could we represent them on, on a space-time as propagators? Well, we can if the higher point functions, the three and four point functions, etc., if they are diagonalizable. Remember, they are not the ordinary kind of operator that maps one vector into one vector. They would be operators because they are like vertices. They map multiple fields into one, multiple vectors into one vector. If they are diagonalizable, if they happen to be diagonalizable, well then, let's call these diagonal bases coordinate bases. Why? Well, because in the quantum field theories that we know, the vertices are all local, which means they are all, in the position representations, products of direct deltas, that makes sure that when particles collide with each other, they do so at the same point. Microcausality, right? So in other words, if the vertices, or I mean, I shouldn't call them vertices, if the multipoint correlators, if they are diagonalizable, well, then the basis in which they are diagonal, we can call a positional basis, and we can then write all of our correlators in such a basis, and then we get the endpoint functions, and once we have the endpoint functions, including the two-point function, we can get the metric from that, and suddenly we have quantum field theoretical correlators living on a curved space time. So what it hinges on is the diagonalizability of these correlators. But in general, of course, uh, fundamentally, we cannot expect that that is so, because the, the, the fact that the vertices in quantum field theory are all obeying microcausality, that they're all fully local, is not demanded by mathematics. It's demanded by the physics of it, right? And here we have a mathematical structure that doesn't demand the diagonalizability. In general, therefore, it won't have that, which means that fundamentally we would then have a web of informational structure, a bunch of correlators, abstract operators on some Hilbert space, which in some regime, in some regime that we may call a low energy regime, these endpoint functions would then be, let's say, approximately diagonalizable, and therefore the correlators are then representable as quantum field theoretical correlators on the space time manifold, at least approximately. So, in this sense, then, if we have this diagonalizability of the higher order correlators, then we naturally get in a regime. Uh, a representation of this structure in quantum, as a quantum field theory, or as quantum field theories, like the standard model, um, on some curved space-time. So I'm, I'm finishing here with um, parking back to the beginning. At the beginning, the question I asked was, is information theory just versatile? Does it just provide tools for quantum gravity? Or could it be universal? Could it be that quantum, that quantum gravity, space, time, and matter even just emerge from um, a theory that is purely informational? And then I'd like to finish with a follow-up question, which is that if this were so, if information theory is truly in universal, not just versatile, but universal, and underlies quantum gravity, is it then even still information theory? See, the, what I would conjecture or su suggest is that in this case, the underlying information theoretic structure of these operators could just be considered a structure. Like in mathematics, where you have some structures and then concrete representations of it. It could be just some abstract structure, and information theory 
may itself just emerge as, you know, with its interpretation of this is information before we didn't know, now we know, that aspect that gives information theory its name, information theory, that may itself only emerge in the low energy regime where we recover, you know, the universe as we know it, uh, consisting of quantum fields that live on the space time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akim. Thank you, for, uh, thank you to Pablo, Rob, and Eugenio for uh, the very inspiring uh, and lots of ideas, a lot of uh, um, uh, things to discuss in, in uh, the next two hours, but now it's time for coffee and uh, donuts, uh, especially for the people who were not here in the previous day.